the best quote I heard was, to, to make it, you can make yourself miserable or happy, it takes the same amount of work. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy. With yours truly, Michael Kahan. Holy moly, today's guest can do it all. I felt incredibly uplifted and empowered after my chat with Tahir. He moved me around with his incredible mindset around life, which we dive into. He oozes happiness, has a brilliant forward-thinking approach, plus he's versatile, a great conversationalist with plenty hilarious stories. This is not a chat to miss, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So let's get into it and officially introduce Tahir to the podcast. Tahir Biljic is an award-winning, internationally acclaimed stand-up comedian, a Logie-winning actor, as well as a writer, director, and producer. He is known for his hugely popular live performances, as well as an impressive collection of credits spanning multiple highly successful television shows. Tahir is quite simply one of Australia's greatest and most recognized comedians. Over the course of his career, Tahir has written, directed and starred in over a dozen major stage shows. Lord of the Kebabs, an ensemble piece of sketches and stand-up, enjoyed over 100 performances and was seen collectively by 20,000 people all across the nation. Tahir has also appeared many times on television as a performer, actor and guest on shows such as Rove Live, The Footy Show, All Saints, House Offs, Swift and Shift Couriers, Thank God You're Here, The Librarians, Bogan Hunters, and Foxtel's The Comedy Channel. When the hit SBS comedy pizza entered its fourth series, Tahir joined its cast as the womanizing drug dealer Habib and instantly cemented himself as one of the show's best-loved characters. Habib was so popular that in fact he soon demanded his own live stage production, leading to the sellout smash Habib on Parole. The character Habib is one of the most hilarious and popular characters ever seen on Australian television. He then went on to co-write and star in several feature-length movies with the pizza team such as Fat Pizza, House Sauce vs. Authority and Fat Pizza vs. House Sauce. Remarkably, the Fat Pizza movie enjoyed one of the all-time most successful opening weekends ever for an Australian movie release. Tahir was also co-creator of the Channel 9 sitcom Here Come the Habibs and was a contestant on the 2019 season of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. And according to his biography, he's currently in talks to host his own television show and has recently signed on to star and produce his own movie with production to commence shortly. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot, such as his world record, his love of comedy, his previous life as a teacher, going with the flow and finding out who you are, why he's so happy, his growth and forward-moving mindset, being the world's best worst magician, timing and luck. Before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I find it adds a new element and dynamic to these chats, I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure, so check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5pm Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. We're talking off air, and there's so many different places we can start, but I think we'll start here because this is, I don't know this about you, and I find this really fascinating. Mm. Can you tell me about your Guinness World Record and why you did it? Guinness World Record? Um, What do you mean? Remind me. The pizza. Oh, the pizza, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I was like, shit, have I done the wrong research? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So uh, basically, um, we wanted to break the record to, you know, to deliver pizza around the world. And Paul Fennick, uh, you know, he did it basically. And he found the longest flight you could take. Like, like he actually found from New Zealand and then they tracked where it could be the longest flight, which is exactly the other side of the world. Oh, wow. Like one track. And so they sort of worked it out and they, um, and they froze the pizza, <laughs> like actually, and he actually had to deliver it somewhere. So it had to be a proper delivery. So the point was they went to a lot of trouble to do it. I can tell. So how could, nobody could break the, like you can't break that record because you'd have to do the exact same thing to get all that trouble and book flights and get the site, like the pizza. Nobody would actually get in trouble doing it. You know, it's, it's not one of those records where, you know, some records you can set and people get, you know, we can do it faster, we can do it better. Well, they actually worked out the longest possible way to do it without being broken. Like, it's probably so, the only world yeah. record that won't be broken. Only world record that won't be broken. Like you could, yeah. And nobody would try to even attempt it as well. One of my mates, he, I can't remember exactly, but I think he played FIFA, the video game, the yeah. game for the longest time. I think it was like 24 hours straight. He had to always be playing and he broke the record. He was so excited. And then shortly after someone broke it and he was devastated. That's, At least. Yeah. And there's a, quite a bit to get in the Guinness as well. You've got to, um, you've got to pay someone, you've got to pay an amount, depending if you're a big company or whatever, someone's oh. going to be there to, to, you know, there's, there's a bit involved, you know, there's a bit involved in it. Did you have a Guinness world records guy with you on the plane for that? I had, no, no, I had to be <laughs> official. Like you got, there's a lot of paperwork because we looked into, um, I looked into breaking uh, records for like stand up comedy. Like there's, there's crazy Americans that have done like a 72 hour show. Yeah. Like, Lima has done something. He won yeah, a world record. Yeah. People like back and forth. And then the solo show was, I think, like 42 from memory or 44, something like that. So somebody did stand up comedy for 42 hours straight. <laughs> and they said, like, at, by the end, like they were delirious and, it's just crazy. And there's all and there's all these rules again. Like you got to go. I think you get like a five minute break every hour. You wow. can't rep you can't repeat anything. Like you know what I mean. You've got to just you know, keep doing stand up or talking or whatever whatever it is. And and there's got to be um. It just can't be talking. There's got to be like set up and jokes and punchline as well. Like a certain amount per. There's all these yes. rules. And, yeah, yeah. Limo was saying um also stand up comedian in Australia for those mm. who don't know. Yeah, yeah. Limo's great. He <laughs> he told us so he's broke. I'm sure it's been broken, but he, I think he broke a world record for doing stand up as well. Yeah. It was the most amount of jokes in a certain amount of time. And he planted people in the crowd because I think the rule was someone had to laugh at the joke for it to be a joke at that stage. So, so he just it. paid people, he had mates there, and they would laugh every like few minutes so he could get his world record. I like it. So many different ways. So, what was the the goal or the point of getting the world record. Obviously it means a lot to you because you forgot about it, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Guinness book record. That's not my biggest achievement, <laughs> but um, I think it was more for publicity for the, uh, because, you know, we did, when we did those uh, overseas episodes for fat pizza, which is a Australian sitcom been going for over 20 years, whole generations grown up with us. Um, it was, so we went around the world like twice, like I, I did one I couldn't do because I was at the Melbourne Comedy Festival, but the second one I did. And we did one lap of the earth and we did six episodes in four weeks. And we wow. had a very basic skeleton script. Like, wow. I mean, like, you know, just, we just, whatever we saw along the way, we just filmed and just improvised. And it was great. We did our own makeup and, and sound. And we filmed in areas you couldn't film like uh, Thailand. <laughs> the, the you know the sex street yeah yeah somebody owns that street we filmed in there like big warnings everywhere right Let, big warnings everywhere no filming prosecution to private you'll be this that and we think oh my god and we had a camera guy had the, the camera in the backpack he had a little camera just on the backpack <laughs> strap right so we're in these we're in these clubs and it's filming like there's all these you know you know those sex clubs they're filming this I go, this is this is just no good. Like this is dangerous. It feels dangerous. And then he'd film and then he'd go to the toilet to check his shots. So he'd come back and goes, Okay, no guys, we just gotta angle it this way a bit and you know. Um but one of the funny stories was uh um whilst we're filming we're doing lines in the club and we're doing like, you know, trying to do our scripts and uh this lady boy would 
would come to me like, you know, says, hello, you want a good time? Like, and, and I'm just trying to do my, I'm trying to memorize the lines and scripts yeah. and the things. And, and she would not let me, leave me alone. Honestly, would not leave me alone. Um, a girl, like I thought. And so just constantly coming to me, like, you know, like, you know once they target you, that, that's it. They don't leave you alone. They don't leave. They want your money. They'll get. I yeah, want your money. And, and you know, there. maybe I just made eye contact. I don't know. But eventually this is my game plan, Michael. You, you, you're going to love this. Try to get rid of her. I said, listen, I just said, I'm gay. That's it. I thought that was because I was with Kev, the Kiwi filming, you know, and I just said, I'm gay. And her reply said, you gay? No problem. I'm half man. <laughs> <laughs> and then we laughed and laughed for 10 minutes. We couldn't film. Like, you know, it was the funniest thing. She was laughing. It was just, it was one of the funniest things. And you should have got her in the script and said, hey, we've got a role for you. I know. I, like, and the pink, like, when the, uh, you know, they do the ping pong balls, you know? Um, yeah, unfortunately, I'm aware of it. Yeah, so I, I we had some ping pong bats. <laughs> so, we, <laughs> so I, it was my idea to get some bats. And then when they think, I just, we start playing you know, table tennis. <laughs> um, it was, yeah, it was, I can't believe we didn't get arrested, honestly. I was about to say, I've been to Thailand. I never went into the shows, but my mates did. And like, it is, it's actually a scary place because it's when scary. they target you and my friends oh. are, smaller that they like shake you up for money they try and like pour you more drinks and do stuff to you and you know you've come there as the actor and you're just oh. trying to i don't know how you did it no and nobody knew we we're filming like we went all around the world we went to like eiffel tower right so oh, wow. I'm, I'm taking i'm in like a yellow track suit and kev's in a track and paulie's in a red track suit and we got and we just and then some australians see us and they take photos with us like down the bottom of the eiffel tower yeah. And then a, then a Japanese tourist sees us and they think we're some sort of boy band or rock and roll group or someone. Like they know they're taking photos with us for no reason other than that. We look different. We're colorful and they see other people taking photos with us. It's really strange. So I've got a hot bag, hot pizza bag taking up to Eiffel Tower. I get stopped by security. So what are you doing? Why are you taking this hot pizza box up to the Eiffel Tower? <laughs> and, and then he opens it up. It's empty. I go, what is there? Is there a reason why I can't? They go, they just shrug. They go, all right. Yeah, they so, wouldn't know what to do. So we take it up there. And then I, I don't know if you've been like, it's very peaceful, very quiet. It's Paris. It's very romantic. And everyone's just really serene and enjoying the view. And I'm thinking, oh, no, because I know what we're about to do. We're about, <laughs> to, we're about to create a scene and film it. But nobody knows a filmmaker because it's all been secretly filmed, right? And part of the thing was there's going to be a bit of pushing, shoving, and we're arguing over a girl. And I go, oh, no, we're about to ruin these people's experiences because they've come all over the world. This is a big moment. It's packed, you know. It's very quiet, serene. And then Paulie goes, all right, guys, get in position. And then action. It <laughs> kind of reminds me of the Borat scene where... Um, oh, yeah, yeah. That's... With Azamat and Borat are, like, fighting. Oh, each other. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it was like, Michael. And then we start with pushing, shoving, screaming. And then, of course, everyone turns around, stops, and then they clear the path away from us crazy idiots. Like, and we do the same push shoving and they go, oh no. And then he goes, cut, bang, we pack up and then we get out of there. Totally ruined people's experience of Eiffel Tower. <laughs> like, or made their experience. Or made their experience, yeah. Yes, they well, they want, yeah. A glass half full approach. I think that's really awesome. We, I know this is a huge show and it's going to be in the Australian, oh, it's also around the world. It's very popular, but it's like seen as one of the best shows that Australia's ever done. But before we get onto it, I just think it's crazy in such a positive way. Not many people can go with the flow like that. You know, you spoke about Thailand. It is actually scary when you're in those environments mm. or you've only got really one take. You have to be, you, you know, it's hot, your senses are heightened and you need yeah. to read your lines and you need to be in the moment and to actually perform. You don't have a huge budget, it sounds like as well. You only get like that one go. Well, yeah, absolutely, Michael. You're spot on all those things. And we, as we saw things, we just did things. So like one of the first... Thailand was one of the first countries we visited. And then we saw this massive, giant gold Buddha. Like it was about a meter tall and oh, wow. meter, like, and we just decided we bought it. We just, we just decided to take it with us everywhere we went, right? So this thing Wait, came a meter. Out, You're just like a meter, Yeah, this big carrot, giant Buddha, like gold Buddha. We just, we said that we liked this and we just took it with us, right? How did you and, carry it? That thing would waste so much. Yeah, we sort of somehow, you know, it was, it was sort of hollow inside, and then like, but it wasn't like solid. But um, and we just took it with us, and eventually, of course, what happened was this, and I haven't told this story before. 
I, we got to um, we got to Brazil, right? And we, we're going up to see the giant Jesus on on the mountain. And Paul is carrying this. I wasn't in the scene, so I, I'm I'm going I'm I'm on the outside, just going up with him, watching. But I could see security get running everywhere, going crazy, because I see this guy carrying this massive Buddha, you know, yeah, wow. up up the mountain, and they're going, and I, I could see him like on the walkie talkies going around, like, and eventually. Before he gets to the top, I'm there, crew's there, and they stop him. They go, mate, what's going on? <laughs> what are you doing with the giant Buddha? And then Paul, he goes, I brought this giant Buddha to meet the giant Jesus. <laughs> the family reunion. <laughs> and that, that was his answer. And, and they sort of looked and said, uh, all right. Like they had no answer. They had no answer. Goes, Does it not just show like confidence is key? You just yeah, see how yeah. He goes, I'm bringing the religions together. And they go, all right, that's it. And, and that was it. So... Confidence is the key, you're right. Have an answer ready. Wow. So that whole experience, you know, you've been involved in that, like, fran- if it's a franchise, I don't even know what to call it, for so long. You've been able to, like, deal with all of those punches. Did it make you a better performer and actor? Did it keep you in the flow? Was improv something that you had before? Yes. Uh, look, I've always loved improv. Um, and I love uh, theatre sports. Ah, yeah. Community. I love that community. Uh and if I wasn't a stand-up, I'd be in that community. But I love stand-up so much. It's always going to be my number one passion. People, gonna, people don't understand. Like, stand-up is my number one passion and love. Everything else has come about because of that. My, the acting, the impro, everything else has come as a result. People see me stand-up. Um, even, uh, you know, like I did. Uh, like, I, I auditioned for Fat Pizza. People think, like, it's, you know, there's no audition process. But it was, you know, but they saw me doing stand-up. Uh, a oh, lot of TV shows uh, saw me do stuff somewhere and said, hey, would you mind coming on this show? Thank God you're here. Um, or other shows, footy show, whatever. Like, is everything, a lot's come because of stand-up, but that's always my number one thing. No matter what, even if there's 10 people in the crowd, 1,000, 2,000, stand-up. As long as I can do stand-up, Michael, I'm happy. And yeah. I'm loving it more and more. As I, as I get older, I'm still loving it more and more. Not less, but more. What? Well, explain. I appreciate it. Well, I just... I just, you know, early on, like, you know, when you do stand up, it's almost like a trick. You trick yourself, like, because no one's really that good when you start yep. doing stand up, right? Because, but we don't know that. You know, the, 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 uh, the stand up committees don't know that. We get a laugh, we go, oh, we're pretty good. It's not until you realize later on, okay, now I understand what's going on here. And it takes, I don't know, I reckon at least 10 years before you hit, you know, start hitting some straps. I remember wow, 10, 10 years, years ago, wow, I'm really now hitting my straps. And I look back to what I was doing earlier. I'm going, how did I even get away with it? Like, <laughs> if if all the stand ups when they started knew how bad they were, they'd, there'd be no stand ups in this world because everybody would quit, you know. But you just got to get through that process. It's everything's. I call it. It's like a pilot. You have got to get hours up on stage, experience the different audiences, experience the different scenarios, the different techniques. Um, you 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 know that's there's no other way. But, yeah. but jumping on stage and getting through it you can do all the theory you like but um exactly yeah and True. i still think like stand up like what a what a profession what a what a creative art it is like to get up on stage you know because i break it down michael i say look at this i still appreciate i'm standing up here in front of a microphone and an audience has turned up to watch me speak like that's incredible when you break it down mm. and i'm allowed to talk about whatever i want <laughs> that's incredible and they that's have unbelievable. That's unbelievable. Like, you know, and, you know, I can talk about any topic. I can present it any, any way I like. And, um, yeah, I just think that's, it's an incredible profession when you think about it. You know, I can go on so many different tangents, but normally when people have achieved your type of success, they can become maybe egotistical or a bit arrogant. You're just talking about a knowing and a, and a, like a quiet confidence or just a knowing in yourself. But, Often when people do things for so long and they achieve so much success in so many different areas, they can become a bit numb to it. But for you to say, and you're smiling the whole time, but for you to say the whole time that you're liking it more, you appreciate the craft and you appreciate the audience. I find that very remarkable because you don't come across too many people like that in any field, really. It's like, no, thank, yeah, thank you, Mike. I mean, like, I, but I generally like, I mean, I, and I never look at like, I, I, Look, I have done a fair fair bit over the over the years, but I, I only realised when I look back, I go, gee, like, because I'm always 
working on projects and stuff. And um, I'm like, a, I'm like a cook who's got like 10 things cooking at the same time. I'll, I'm, I'm used to that. I, I don't mind that, but yeah. I still, this sounds, this may sound weird, but I'll still put a show on. And then if a show sells out, I'm going, this is, I'm still amazed by it. Like, honestly, oh, like that's, I go, wow, look at this, this, you know, I'm going to Sydney comedy store and 300 people have come to see me. I go, that's incredible. I still mm. appreciate that. Like I, I generally do. I don't just, it's not like a throwaway line, but um, it, yeah. it, it's incredible. Like I go, wow, this is unbelievable. And it's just stand up is it, it's, it, it's an amazing profession. And I always say there's no rules in it. People, people like say so consequently, I've always had that, um, that belief. So there's no rules. So some people think stand up should be what it literally means. Stand up and talk. No, like you could do anything. Like there are some comedians, stand committees who look down on someone who uses a guitar or mm. props or magic. Not me. I, because I've done everything over the years. You and do magic. I do magic. I use props. I'll do whatever on stage. Because I can, I, and I've done shows straight one hour shows, right? But I always think as an audience, what would I like to see? I would, I like to see a bit of variety. And so I just give the sort of show I want to see as an audience and throw a lot, lot at them. I'll throw a bit of impro, throw a bit of stand-up, throw a bit of observation, I'll throw different stuff. And to me, the audience is a judge and they don't care what you do as long as you're entertaining. Mm. They don't say, oh, that guy's very funny, but he used a guitar. Like, no, they don't say that. They just think, funny or not, that's it. That's the way they break it. Only the performers try to, try to define what stand-up is. Yes. As I... long as you're entertaining and you're consistently funny, You've done your job. I've heard some performers over the years like, oh, they're not a real comedian because they use a guitar. Oh. And oh. it drives me nuts. And I'm not even one as well because you're a performer. If you get up and you make yeah, people that's laugh. It. Yeah. So my thing is the, end, the crowd doesn't know about any definition. They just know, is this person funny or not? That's mm. it. Yeah? That's, that's the whole, yeah. but it, when it, yeah, when it, the crux of it, like when you break it down, it's very simple, very simple. So, and, and, why should we define it? Like why there should be no definition because who knows people are coming up with new ways to deliver comedy, stand up different stuff all the time. So you put a parameter on it. Well, you've restricted it. So right. somebody might be coming up with something completely we haven't thought of, you know, it's been, you know, um, Hannah Gatsby came up with her show and, and it was a different way to present it. Like, you know, again, yeah. no sort of parameter. Like, and, um, it's great. It's great to see. I agree. It's always, it's a weird thing. I don't know if it's insecurities on people's behalf. Yeah, or yeah. They're like, I did it this way. So you have to do that. But that's yeah. like old school thinking in my mind. Like you can even be a comedian and do like tick shop, TikTok live shows. People are doing that. Anything. Exactly. Yeah. And from the ego side, I know that you're a very humble guy. So bear with me. Still, to achieve all of this success, you know, you sell out shows, you've done movies, there's a whole bunch of stuff we'll get into. Naturally, what we're seeing in the world when people do achieve like high levels of success and consistently, it can impact the ego and it can impact our way of life. I'm just wondering, did you ever have moments in your life where you became the hot head and you had to be cooled down? Or is this like family values and your upbringing? Or is it just simply you love the craft so much and you're not going to let it steer you in a weird negative direction you, you mean in terms of impacting me for stand-up comedy yeah just having that hot head and thinking like you're top shit oh yeah no no i mean look i had a just a good normal solid upbringing and uh that's why some of those shows um you know like you know you, you go on some of these shows and i want to know do a backstory mm. i've got none <laughs> you know, like it's, I had well you have an interesting parents, story lovely parents you know upbringing um but with stand-up comedy, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I started my mid-20s stand-up because, you know, I sort of left teaching and then mid-20s started and then TV came after that. So I was thinking, and I realized like, you know, look, I know some people come up and talk to you because they've seen you on the show, like, not because, you know, so maybe if I was 18, I would think, you know what? Yes, I'm a real hot shit. Uh, but <laughs> That was never my style anyway, because I'm, I'm a pretty relaxed individual. Yeah, I can tell. Um, I got, you know, I understand yeah, everything's in perspective. I get it, you know. I, I understand the, the 
and if so, and to this day, people come up and chat to me. I always have a chat, want a photo, no problem. I get it. It's their it's their experience. They get it. You know, if, if I if I saw if I, if I saw Robert De Niro, I'd do the same thing. Hey yeah, man, I'm a big fan. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but um, and if he was uh, if he was sort of uh, you know mean or like rude, I think oh well that would change my experience. But uh, I don't understand how some performers get frustrated. I mean, look, I, sometimes I do because they, they come up with weird times. Sometimes you're eating or you know some. People don't sort of get it, but yeah. um, but it's the business we're in. If you want to be on TV or on stage or being in a prominent business, it's going to come with it. Like if you don't like all the uh, you know the, the people coming up, go to another job. <laughs> like that's going to be. It's, it's <laughs> true, but there's there's two things. Like one, just when a lot of people, you know, when you've got a sold out crowd, because it's not necessarily a normal thing where three hundred mm-hmm. people all eyes on you, like clapping, laughing. Mm-hmm that can impact one's view of themselves. And we can, I've seen this with many people and they've been steered back. And some people have talked about this on the podcast where they develop this like higher sense of ego. Like, wow, I'm, I'm amazing. And look at me. And that doesn't seem to have impacted you. I know that you, I think you did teaching for quite, quite a few years as well. And maybe that humbled you in your upbringing, but still just naturally when you've got so many eyes on you, so many people saying you're doing good work and you are doing good work it can impact one, but it just sounds like, like, yeah, this is the job I've done. Not going to impact me. But you know what, Michael, like, or yeah, that's, I had a real job as a teacher, but um, uh, what's funny is sometimes like, you know, I'll be at the, uh, let's say Enmore Theatre, yep. 1600 people, amazing show, big, big production, um, you know, and there's a meeting grid and everyone's having photos. You know what happens? People must think, look, look at you, they go, that he, they probably think it's a rock and roll band. They must probably go back to there must be massive after party it's really i just laugh because like eventually you're in the car by yourself driving home <laughs> like, you know? yeah and then you get home and the whole family's asleep they don't know what's happened <laughs> yeah. you know and then you're going to put the rubbish out and <laughs> just, you know, realize, get humbled very quickly yeah yeah that, it's just so funny like you know and um you realize early on but like yeah just absolutely normal uh, absolutely just normal and uh yeah, I often think they must think what happens afterwards. There must be a huge party. No, nothing. Straight you just go home. <laughs> you yeah. just go home. It, right? I had one guest, and he was um, the star of one American TV show that went on for ages. I, f- I forget which one it was. And he worked his entire life building up towards this. And he was so excited. He's going to probably make God knows how much money. And he gets, he's on the top of his apartment, like the 40 something. Um, level he looks over sees this incredible view and he realized that it didn't mean anything he spent all this time building towards it but he had no one to share it with he had such a i wouldn't say like egotistical mindset but he had such a strong goal that he kind of forgot about the rest of life and he realized in that moment he kind of had to change his mindset in that yeah you can have all like the fame and the fortune but there's more to life than that and it sounds like you've got a pretty good balance around that as well yeah look i yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Because you know, people as human beings, we're always um, it's it it always weird to me how we're always looking for look, not looking forward to, but like, hey, I can't wait for the weekend. Like, why you you want to you want to just give up five days so you can enjoy two? Why, why don't you just enjoy the the day? I, I know it's I don't want to be like, no, 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 I, I'm on the same page as you. But yeah, like, what about enjoy the the day, the moment? Today, like always looking forward to something. I can't wait for the break. I can't wait for the holidays. I can't wait for this. I can't wait till this is over. Um, and then what are you striving towards? What are you working towards? Well, you know, just uh, just enjoy uh, almost like you've got to take a pause and take a step back. And um, and as I said, like I've had uh, you know, we, we've had some things that have you know gone sour and 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 fail, but uh, I've learned learned early on, like just like stand up comedy. Uh, early on, you get some. Um, of course, you're going to get some uh, bad shows and yeah, bombs. You're going to get some, but of course, if you haven't, every stand-up comedy goes through it. And many, because, not just well, one, many. Uh, because stand-up comedy is subjective. It's it's subjective. Like it's it's like art. Like uh, some people enjoy you, some people won't enjoy you because everyone's got different styles and different things. And um, I get that. I, you know, I didn't get it early on, but eventually, you go, okay, I get this. Like this crowds, you know. And that's why we can do your own shows and they come, uh, you know, specifically to see you. Like, it's amazing. Like, 
because they're there to see you. They know you, you are, your style. But um, early on, like, you know, I, I would really, if I had a bad set, it, it, it affects you. Like, you know, you of get course. home, you think, oh, man, like, that, was, that was bad. It was horrible to go through. Nowadays, I just, honestly, I just brush it off so quickly. Like, I'm out. I'm, okay, gone. Doesn't matter. How did you uh, figure that out? Like, uh, to not let it impact you? Well, you know, I figured, like, you know, my set is funny most of the time, you know, and uh, so I, I just, in my head, there's other factors, Michael. It's not me, it must be them. <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> I love it. You know what I mean? Like, because. And that's fine. Like they, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't dig me. Fine, no problem. I get, and I don't blame them either because maybe my style of jokes wasn't to their taste, and that's fair enough. Like you know, you know. Uh, but these days, I really get into the audience. I improvise. I get a reaction. I'll delve in. I don't let it go. You know what I mean? Like so, it's going to be. Um, there's less and less bombs, certainly as you get more experienced, and because uh, you have a bit more, uh, you know, bigger bag of tricks. Yeah. Uh, a lot more material. Uh, sometimes these are, I'll start a show, then I'll go a completely different way, um, you know, because of you know the audience, the setting, or corporate environment, or a show, whatever it is. Of course, when you first started, you had a, this twenty-minute set as a support act, and that was it. And if the audience didn't like it, well, they were going to hear that twenty minutes. No matter what, you couldn't you couldn't stop and to go a different direction, or or you know somebody will throw something at you and it reminds you of a bit you did, and you can dig it out. Um, so it's, it's a lot different. You have, you have a lot more tools and you know, skills. It's all uh, about the reps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like people often ask me, how do you remember? It's like a filing cabinet. Like you just, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah it's there. I've always found that very interesting and I want to talk about your process in a bit, but I wanted to go back to that, um, the thing you said before about why you're just waiting for the weekend because I think that's really important. And my previous life, I used to be an accountant and mm-hmm. I was I was that type of person that would be looking to the weekend. Oh, I can't wait to get drunk with the boys, so I would forget Monday to Friday. And then well, I heard similar advice to you. Well, in the sense of like, what am I actually waiting for? Mm. What's going to happen if you are just living your life of two days of seven days? Then you're not really living your best life. And long story short, I've quit and now doing this and screenwriting as well. But it's very interesting because everyone's like, oh, it's Monday. And I always, now that I'm on the other side, I find it so interesting. It doesn't mean life's always going to be amazing. Yeah. But I find it so fascinating that we go, oh, it's Monday or it's Wednesday. Because that's a huge chunk of your life. And if you're doing something for a long period of time that you hate, and you're not really living one, your best life, or even a life that, you know, people deserve a lot more. And we don't really hear that. So when you say something like that, it's very empowering to me and hopefully other people as well to know that we don't need to live a, suboptimal life as well good points michael look i always think if you look even if you hate your job if you have to do something you, you might as well do it properly and and and, and positively uh, the best quote i heard was uh to to make it you can make yourself miserable or happy it takes the same amount of work true so i i love that quote like you know and, and i go yes that's true so you know, your choice, like, if you, you're know, sure you might hate it, but like, you actually learn, you, know, you actually teach yourself. I'm going to go to Bill's Monday. I'm going to be just a little bit more balanced and um, I can still enjoy my weekends, but I'm not going to be so miserable or, or I'm going to start of the week or, you know, what, why should we let that? I can't, yeah, I can't believe it. As you said, two out of seven, that's bad, bad sums. Yeah, that's bad percentage. That's, bad <laughs> that's percentage. a fail. Yeah. That's a fail. Yeah. Very interesting. And, um, this will come across to everyone that you seem to be one of the happiest uh, comedians I've ever seen in my life. And even looking into you before, and I saw an article about yeah. certain secrets that you want to share. I just find it. Cause you know, I know you spoke about your upbringing and stuff like stereotypically, it's not everyone. A lot of standups come in because they're hurt or they're depressed or maybe substance abuse or to so many different reasons, but it sounds like you've just come in with like a clean attitude and you're genuinely a very happy person. You're given tools. I want to know, I keep on harping on this. Why are you so naturally happy? It's everyone should be like you. I just find this so, so fascinating. Well, I think it's, I just love what I do. Like I, it, that's what it comes down to. I thought that because, and I'm generally like some people are in the, in the stand comedy and they, and they found some success and it's great. And I still think, mate, you're not even happy. Like, mm. and you, but greater success than I have like that, you know, but um, 
Yeah, I, I know it's all sort of cliche, but if you if you love what you do, it, it's, it goes a long way. And that could be anything, whatever it is. They could be surveying, whatever people are doing. Like, you know, um, if you love what you do, it does make a big difference. And I put it in perspective. I, I always think, like, I'm doing stand comedy. I'm traveling everywhere. Um, in my head, Michael, people are genuinely doing hard work. Like, you know, people, work that I couldn't do. I couldn't be, you know, in an office, for example. Or, yes. or, or it's just not me. Or I can't be in a garage, right? Because it, but some people love that. They love working with cars, tinkering. You know, that, that's their passion, and and that's beautiful, right? But for me, if I was in a garage, I'd get a little bit of oil on my hand. I'd have to clean it straight away. Yeah. It'd drive nuts, you know. Yeah, right, a bit of oil straight away, and then back and forth. It just wouldn't work. Like I'd be yeah. bored within five ten minutes. Honestly, I just no, nah, not for me. But that's that's fine because other people absolutely love it. Like they love their tinkering, working with their hands, and you know, solving problems with the cars and, and that's the key. Just find what you love it. But I think once you do, like you think, yeah, I've done it. I've found what I love doing. And uh, I put it as a perspective, man. I, I just see sometimes I'll get up early in the morning to go to, um, you know, to the airport, mm-hmm. catch another flight somewhere. And I see people on the road, like people going to work and, you know, you know, continue. Just, uh, people, People going to work with their high vis trucks, and I go. These people got up six six o'clock in the morning. They've got to do it every day, and they, and I can see some of them are sleeping, like not, not the drivers, but the passengers sleeping. Yeah. I go, man, that's tough. Like I I, I feel for them. Like, um, yeah, the people doing hard work. I'm not saying stand up, you know, but you know, some people go, oh, you only do forty minutes on stage. It must be like, but they don't realize the hours and years the of time and time that yeah. Time, but yeah, that's yeah. Well, also on that, and um, just a quick one, that whether we work in our passion or not, but everyone's got a passion or hobby within us, and I'm of the firm Absolutely. belief that we've all got it, and it's kind oh, of our responsibility if we want to to try and do that, whether it's for money or not, just even as a hobby, it will greatly help people. But I read an article which was about your happiness, and you gave three tips towards people. This is many years ago, so I'm not sure if you'll remember it. Right, yes. But one of the secrets that you wanted to share was point number two, which is about getting comfortable. And I think this is really important. You wrote, I think it's so important for people to be comfortable by themselves in their own skin. And to me, that's probably one of the most important things we can do in life and also as a performer because the best performer is going to be us, not copying someone else so i'd like you to expand on how you came to that conclusion about being comfortable yeah well i mean look that you it's about who you are like find, once you find out who you are like that's it like i mean people it's really weird how people sort of get upset about who that like i go once you accept who you are then everything else becomes a lot easier yeah. like they don't try to people i see people try to get you know they try to change or they see others there's um, there's envy. Envy is a hu- natural human reaction, like you know. Yeah. Um, and we all we all get envious. Yeah. To different degrees, like there are, whether it's job, workplace, neighbors, cousins, family, anything. It's just it's all there. But uh, once you are comfortable who you are, and if you can stop judging yourself as uh, compared to others and your lifestyle, that's what comfortable is. Like, you know, stop comparing, you know, stop comparing. Don't worry about it. I, I always find it's weird when people put pressure on themselves. Like even things like, oh, I found my soulmate. That's a lot of pressure to say that. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's a lot of pressure. Uh-huh. You know, I always think, how did you find your soulmate? Like, I mean, of all the people in the world, did you, did you, uh, you know, meet everybody in the world? Like, I mean, how do you know your soulmate's not some person in Mozambique? <laughs> that you're perfectly in tune with and, and I would say well, isn't it uncanny Michael how you found your soulmate working in the same building <laughs> Five minute drive <laughs> of, all, from your of all the people in the world the same city as country building that's incredible but what are the chances what are the odds um, or uh, so it's fine I'm not saying that you know of course there's love but like I'm saying this people, we put pressure on ourselves by saying those sort of things Found my soulmate, and then two years later, they're, they're divorced. What happened? You know, just you found another human being that's decent, and you've got to be accept their positives and negatives, and and that's it. That's you know, uh, 
that's 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 the key takes away from the pressure and i agree mm. with you once we know who we are it doesn't mean we can't work on ourselves and grow but it means Absolutely. looking at someone and being like oh i actually like what they've got but i'm not going to try and be that person yes they're a reminder for us but judging and comparing is the big thing in this industry as well and naturally yeah. there's so many people that you would be peers with where you see maybe they get a tv show and you're like fuck i didn't get the tv show and it is so common and every single stand-up that I've spoken to, especially in Australia, there's always comparing. And one, they might not even have the awareness, but you actually have the awareness behind it. And especially growing up, that can also be a bit of a mindfuck as well. I'll tell you what I complain about, Michael. You want to hear what I complain about? <laughs> yep. And this is, uh, it's been a big bugbear of mine and, and um, I see it as a failure myself. But over the years, right, I could never get onto the Melbourne Comedy Festival Gala. Oh, interesting. You know, they never rated me. I don't know what happened or like what the thing was. No. Like, it's, and no matter what I did, what I achieved, it didn't matter to them. It didn't matter. Like, you know, they were just of the opinion that nah, this guy and his material, not for us. Or I don't, I don't know what it was. Like, I, and it didn't, and I was in the, um, I was in the Raw finals, which is a, which is a nationwide, um, uh, so stand-up comedy competition yeah, around for, for, Australia, for, for, right? around Australia for amateurs and I won the uh, New South Wales um, section was, or two of us went down or three of us went down from New South Wales and I was one of them uh, did well in the final didn't win the final I think one of the other guys won the final actually but I loved the whole experience and I said yeah I came back uh, with a show for the Melbourne Comedy Festival like you know just, just new and then I did a big show uh, like a big theatre production uh, it was called um, Lord of the Kebabs, the Fellowship of the Humless, and it was it was massive, and and I made them a lot of money, and and then yeah, I'd come back each year. Yep, it cannot be because back then, like you know, when I first started, and it was a big deal to be on the gala, mm. and because the gala was like you got on TV, and it really helped sell out your show because people say yep, bang, you know. I remember Stephen K. Amos telling me like he um. He was on the gala and then his whole show sold out. Wow. Like, bang. But it's less impactful these days because uh, other, you know, advertising things come into place and, yep. and less people watching TV. It's not a big deal as, as it once was. But every year, M Michael would ask, my, my manager would ask, you know, my manager, agent would ask, and can Tahi be on the gala? It's a no. It's yeah. a, did you ever get any feedback? Because through my perspective, and I could be wrong, just yeah. looking at that over the years, yeah. it does seem to be a little bit of bias. And even though I love uh, most of the performers there, they seem to pick like a certain criteria of whatever yeah, like, yeah. three people are. And have you ever gotten like that feedback? No feedback. Just it's just a no. Uh, it's it just you know. And I, <laughs> I look at I look at the galas and. Um, it's just a small thing, but it, but it, but it, it you know it does bug me, and it has bugged me over the years. And I see it as God, why not? Like, you know, what do I have to do? What do I have to achieve? Do they not see the shows I've done? Um, do not, and I, not the TV shows. I'm talking about like you know, the, the live shows, and yeah, because I do. I've done the Sydney Comedy Gala on TV, different stuff. I've I've done really really well on it, you know. Um, you you perform to huge amounts of people. You've had sold out shows, and I'm sure there's times where you've had more people come to your shows than the people on the gala as well. Well, and you know what happened? I just stopped going to the Melbourne Comedy Festival. I stopped going. You know, I just go outside. I go, can I be in a gala? No, okay, I'm not coming. They don't care. But it's not that you know. And I've got friends on the board there and different stuff, so I don't want to say too much. <laughs> but uh, you know, but I can say that you know I see it as a as a, it's a disappointment. It's a failure, you know, but not a failure, but um, it has bugged me over the years. Why, what criteria do they choose? You know, as you said, do they give you feedback? There's no feedback. Yeah. That's always, no, I've I always go, why? That's annoying. Like yeah. early on. Yes. I was just new, but then I go, well, well, how can I not, you know, for what reason? No, because they've got other people they need to get. On. Who knows? Who knows? Like you know? there'd be politics and all of that stuff. But one thing to hopefully, yeah. Uh, positively change your mindset around that is that, you know, you, as I said before, you get so many people see your shows and to me, that's way more important than like five people who decide who might not either have strong comedy brains. We don't know. We don't need to get into that side, but the proof's in the pudding that you're obviously like a top tier performer and 
you don't really, or I can say this from my high horse, you don't really need like five people, whoever they are, to say, we're the gatekeepers. We're going to let you in yeah, yeah. You decide to. You know, you've broken that mold. You've got the success away from that as well. No, thank you, Michael. But isn't it funny how like they're the sort of, see, everyone's got little things I think about. And that's like, I, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm finally, okay, like now, okay, like I, I move on and I'll do Melbourne uh, on my own tours and outside the festival, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just a thing that I never achieved that. Never managed to get on. Well, I would still challenge yeah. you to think bigger than that because Melbourne yeah. Comedy Festival or not, sold out shows, bigger crowds than sometimes yeah. the Melbourne International Comedy Festival can actually provide. And you've been doing that for, first of all, you've got one of the longest careers in the Australian comedy industry as well, which is crazy. And I'd much rather have your career, not that I'm comparing then, be on the gala every year, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. But like, yeah, but I want to be on the gala, Michael. <laughs> we'll put it. We're putting it out there. If anyone knows, we'll we'll get no, you. No, they, they, they'll see this and they get definitely not now. Definitely <laughs> not now. Well, maybe it might encourage someone to relook at it. Who knows? We, yeah. You only you, you you're a humble, positive guy. But I I want to come back to something you said before, and you kind of brushed over it. And I think this is really interesting. You started out as a teacher, and I know that you've probably spoken about this a lot. But I think it's so interesting the journey of one becoming a teacher and then doing all the stuff that you've done. And you were working for many years and i'm just interested what made you actually i know that i'm uh, saying a lot so you just come mm. in uh steer me that while you're doing teaching you actually tried to do stand up like five or six times but you chickened out and i just find that so interesting yes. so can you tell me a little bit about why teaching then well teaching um you know i went to uni uh i i, I, did, I like teaching Maybe I went to uni because I had ethnic parents, right? So I, you know, they go, you know what, to appease them. That's because that's what they saw as success. I have and, the same. My parents are South African. I'm first born here. So I know that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I actually dabbled in law, two terms, found it boring. Um, <laughs> and uh, out, like I know, because it was, I, I didn't mind um, torts and contracts. And then it got here. And I was like, no, actually, not for me. So I just say, this is not for me. And, and I was doing it for my parents. And I said, I'm, I'm going to do this for myself, not for my... And I enjoyed teaching. Teaching was fun. Uh, I only taught for uh, maybe four or five years. That's tops. pretty long. Yeah. That was, and, you know, but during... Whilst I was in primary school, high school, I, I, I was loving comedy, collecting comedy, writing comedy bits, collecting comedy quotes, tell all sorts of things. And I didn't know why I was doing it, but I, I was doing it. And... It all started in primary school, Michael. I don't know. I, I, I don't think I've told this story, but I started like, you know, in primary school, you had to do a sports report, right? And I, I did a sports report and I just made it humorous and people laughed and they go, oh, this was an amazing feeling. And then they got me to do it every week. So every week I was up. Oh, cool. In a sports report. Like, and there were, I, I remember like, you know, getting up and there'd be a buzz in the assembly. Oh, he's getting up. He's going to be funny. Like, you know, <laughs> and even back then, I remember like, it was really weird because even back then I was experimenting because one week I decided to do a straight. <laughs> like, yeah, well, imagine a kid just thinking about that. That is crazy. Just to muck around with him. So I remember getting up and there was a bit of buzz. Yeah, he's tired. He's getting up. It's going to be funny because every week the teachers are laughing, the kids are laughing and, and I'll do stupid jokes. Like, oh, it was a very exciting game. The crowd were on their feet because there was no chairs and, uh, you know, just jokes like that. And, um, and I remember I just did this straight and everyone just looked really confused. <laughs> no jokes, straight. And I sat down and they went, what, what? I thought, what a weird thing. To exp Even then I was experimenting, like, you know, saying, wouldn't it be funny if I just did a straight one just to Sorry. shock them? So, hey, I, go, what I was in primary school. So that's how all that started. And, and you know, during uh, uni, I was, I was really into comedy collecting. And um, during... Uh, what is comedy collecting? You mean watching a lot of stuff? Watching stuff. I'd be, I'd be I, if I saw a funny quote, I'd keep it and write it down, and, and you know, and I th then I thought thought of funny topics, and I'd write the topics down, and then I'd I'd collect um funny movies, and I, I don't know why I was even doing all this. You know, I was just it was just I just I just loved it. I just loved it. Like I'd, I'd uh, uh, I think it was during it was during uh. During uni, it's either during uni or the early years of teaching, where I found out about the Sydney Comedy Store. 
Yeah. Right. And someone said, you know, there's a place, and I couldn't believe my ears. They said, there's a place we can get up. Anybody can get up. It's called Open Mic. It's on a Tuesday night, and it can be an amateur. You can just rock up, just write your name down, and just get up. And that just blew my mind away, Michael. Like, You're joking. Wait, I could just get up and just talk in front of a crowd and perform comedy. They go, yeah. So, uh, you know, most people would hear that and they go, wow, no way. But for yeah, me, that's... the excitement was like, it was, it was, I remember clearly how excited I was. And I was down there straight away. And you, you probably read, like, you know, because I have said this story a few times, but um, I got up and I was, I was full, full intention to put my name down on a Tuesday night. And I turned up and I just chickened out. I said, nah. I'm not quite ready mentally, you know? Mm. And my mates would come down with me too. And and this went on for six weeks. Six Crazy. weeks. Yeah. I turned up for six weeks straight with the full intention of writing my name down and getting up and performing. And I didn't do it. I chickened out. And I remember week five, I was fully up for it. We, I go, this is the week. Week five, I was fully up for it. But the audience numbers were so low, they moved the show from the main room the comedy room in the Sydney comedy store to front of the pub. <sighs> front of the bar, pub where there was a bar, there was, no, there was a few, few guys drinking, uh, they erected a curtain. Uh, there, was, there was a very busy road, Parramatta Road with buses going past, like just oh. right behind you. It was noisy. I looked around. I thought, no, this can't be my debut. <laughs> so it's, Chicken out again. Chicken out again. And then week six, I got up. And I, that was, and I, I got up and I had my four mates with me. And yeah, you know, when you bring mates and uh, you know first up, they laugh at everything. So oh, that's like, nice. Mine would have laughed at me. Well, they, they were like, you know, they, they're your support crew. They're yeah. laughing no matter what, you know. But look, the show went really well, like you know, as well as can be expected first. And it was, and I was away. Once you get the bug, you're away. And uh, if, of course, eventually, it's easy early on for your mates to turn up and family and friends, but eventually they stop coming. Yeah, <laughs> they give it up. Yeah, they go, like early on they'll support you, but then eventually they just stop. They go, no, we're, we're busy, man. We, we've we've seen you, um, and then it was I was away. But within, I reckon, within a year or so, like, it didn't take me long before the the the, the, the manager of the Sydney Comedy Store, Jane Sweetapple, was very supportive. Um, she invited me for a Saturday night to do a five minute spot, and that was a big buzz. And, um, and eventually, my aim was to get a paid spot so i was teaching and i got a paid spot and i cracked it and i thought this is incredible a support spot i'm paid to do comedy yeah which is like totally like not even i didn't even care about the money but it just blew my mind yeah the early early in late show 60 bucks a show 120 bucks uh because i'll never forget it right 30 bucks minus for tax 90 dollars early and late show that would have been a lot show. then as well yeah, but I, I just I go what what I just earned ninety bucks, like you know, doing, like it was it was incredible doing comedy. But, yeah, I would have you know I would have done it for free, of course. Like, um, but it was just incredible, and and then I was away, and then within a year or two, um, I was I got up on the footy show to do a live set, and now when I think back on it, Michael, that was crazy. What was it doing? I have been doing it for like eighteen months, two years, and here I am on national television in Australia. Doing a live set because it was genuinely li genuinely live back then. Live, yeah. it could have it could have gone so bad, and and if you do a live set and it goes terrible, everyone remembers. And, and so the four channels as well. Everyone remembers, and if you do well, they go, "Well, that guy's funny," and thankfully, it went super well. The audience was clapping, and they were they were clapping throughout the set. And, but only when I later on, it's it's when, when I thought about it, I thought. What was I doing? What was I thinking? Why didn't I say yes to that? <laughs> You're like, going it, with your passion. I was going with my passion, but when you, it was such a dangerous thing to do early on. But like well, it was only only four minutes. Like like it was three or four minutes, and I could cover that. You know, um, not you know. I, if they said do fifteen, the game would have been up. Well, this I guy's, think this guy's funny for five minutes, and that, that's it. That's all he's got. That's still very hard, and for people that maybe don't appreciate the how long it takes one two years to be on one of the biggest shows at the time in australia one it's live that's crazy it's not heard of and you hear of people in the stand-up world it takes many years before they can even earn like five dollars it doesn't really matter and 
you were really quick to jump off the gate. And it sounds like you were just following your passion, just doing this because you love it. But what you do, what I didn't say was like, you know, when I started comedy and I got the bug, like I was at every open mic night I could get to. Like, you know, so it wasn't just the Sydney Comedy Store. Three times a week, wherever oh, there was nice. comedy, I'll while be teaching. there. Uh, whilst teaching, yeah, I'd be, I'd be there. Wherever there's comedy, I'll be there. I'd be there. Then I found out about the iconic Harold Park comedy. Bang. So excited. I was down there within a flash. Got really excited. And there was the other comedy clubs. Um, uh, I'd be there. So honestly, when, wherever there's open mics, three, four times a week, I'd be there. I'd be, and then, and then I'd be there on a Saturday night watching the shows, watching the professionals do their thing. Um, oh, nice. I'd be for eighteen months. I, I kept that up. Like I, honestly, I did. And and these days it's really weird because um, I I still watch the show. So if I get booked for a comedy store, I'll go and watch from the start. You know. And oh, so a lot of acts. Most people just leave, but you actually want to. A lot of acts just you know if well if I'm headlining, I'm there from the start watching everything that's happening. Uh, something like just rock up just before the due and i see a lot of the comics and there's no sort of comment on it but like they they do the support then they just leave mm. they don't even watch and go that's i'm not offended but i'm saying if i was doing comedy and you're already there wouldn't you want to watch i'd always watch the headliner see what sort of technique they've got see see what the audience is laughing at see the see uh, see what's happening see their you know see what's going on see the delivery and see how the audience is reacting and see the timing. And um, I'd watch as many acts as I could. And these days I just see most acts, they just leave. And they actually tell you, they go, sorry, do you mind I'm going to leave? I go, you don't have to say sorry to me. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, do I'm not offended, but I'm going to, but in my head, I'm thinking I'd be watching. I'd be watching if you really, would you want to watch? Anyway, it's, it's each of their own, I guess. No, I agree with you. You've got you've got such a passion for the craft that you like. You want to grow and learn still at this age. But I something we just skimmed over, and within a year of you starting, you actually won. I think Sydney Comedian of the Year, which is crazy. Which, crazy. Like, and Harold, pa Harold Park Hotel. Oh, interesting. But you, you know, also like. A lot of people say, I want to start a podcast. I want to do stand up. I don't know why they ask me about stand up. And I always just say, whatever you want to do, just do it. That people always build up excuses. And I'm guilty of this, but you actually were a teacher as well. I know that you ended up doing Juice Bar, which we'll talk about in a sec, but <laughs> you're working a full time job and you still, you know, you'd be very tired. You still got responsibilities and you're still getting up, you know, you said three times a day. That is crazy. It just shows like if you really like something, you can do it. You know, you're oh, working, you're working the job and you've still got time or you made time to actually do the thing that you loved. Oh, absolutely. I was Monday nights. I was always at Harrow Park. Tuesday nights. I was at the comedy store. I think there was something on Thursday nights as well. Uh, somewhere, I can't, maybe Double Bay or somewhere. But then, and then on the weekend, I'd turn up to the comedy store again to watch or Harrow Park, either one. Like I'd turn up to watch what was happening. And, and often I'd ask, excuse me, can I get up? No. Okay. I'm watching. Oh, cool. Sometimes they let you get up, sometimes they don't, like you know. But uh, I'm there, you know. I'm always there, and and always, hey, can I get up? Wherever I went, uh, I just wanted stage time, and um, it's a lot easier in America when there's clubs and people get up at four or five different clubs in one night, uh, and they, you know, they get a lot of stage time really quickly. England as well, same sort of thing. There's a lot of clubs that can, whereas in Australia we didn't really have that. So, but I knew like I wanted as much stage time as possible, you know, and that's that's what I. And I, and I made the effort. And people don't say I was I was at open mics for eighteen months, man. That's crazy. And you're working as well. It just shows. And, and, and I just want yeah. to say, what, like, and I'd be experimenting with material. Like once I got some good, you know, good, good material, I'd I'd bank it. And um, and these days, I you know, if I see an open mic, you know, I might. You see the good acts doing the same material. I say, man, what do you what do you um what do you want to achieve? You got it. That's a really great great solid five minutes. And you've done it now numerous times. Don't you want to do so, another five minutes? Like, because your whole idea is to build your repertoire so you can get booked as a paid act. Yeah. And yet you, you want to get to 15, 20 minutes and then become a headliner. But like, but then again, Michael, it's easy when you turn up to a comedy store, it's packed, right? And the managers are watching, it's a full house, and you want to get up and, and be funny and, and get to adulation. But really, and do the five minutes you know that works. But really, You've achieved nothing. Oh, go on. It's because scary. 
Well, because you know that five minutes works. You're an open micer. But you know, I mean, that's the per. I, it's easier to just to to get nervous and and go, yeah, I want to just do well. Uh, but you know that five minutes works. The manager's already seen you do that five minutes, and you've killed. You know, be be brave, and just you know, and you you might die, and the audience might think you're not that good, but you're developing. You know, you you, you know, you're developing. You you you're building your repertoire. If if you just got five. I still see the same action in five. I go for years and years just doing the same five minutes ago. Is that, if that's all they want to achieve, fair enough. Like, so, you know, some acts, they've got a job and as you like to get up and just do a couple of minutes and, and get their little laughs and, and move on. But um, depends what you want to achieve, I guess. You, you say very um, humbly. I've always, like, there's some comedians, which I won't name, that I've seen over the years and it's the exact same joke. And, I've always, and it's funny, but I've seen it that many times. I've always seen it as fear based. And for the non stand ups, you know, if you, you've got this amazing five minutes worth of jokes and you're saying it every year, like, yeah, that can work, but then you're not going to get, you're not going to get repeat people to see you. you. It might, and then people aren't going to like tell other people to see your shows. But also, if you want to be in the business for as long as you, you have to constantly grow and adapt and change things. And so, through my experience, and it's very limited, is, I've always just seen comedians that do that come from fear. They know that they're going to get guaranteed laughs. This works. And they don't want to necessarily try new things because they, it's just too scary. It's true. It's, 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 it's your podcast of the, the fear of failure, really. Like, I mean, uh, as human beings, we want adulation. Um, but I've seen people in, in open mics for years, for years, Michael. Oh, wow. Like, okay, well, as I said before, if that's what you just, if that's your aim and you've got a job and you just want to dabble in a bit of comedy, fine. But most, I assume most comedians, when they start, they want to um, be paid as a support and, and do a longer set. And the only way to do a 15, 20 minute set is to keep experimenting and, and throwing yourself out there. There's, there's no other way. Um, I but, agree 100%. Yeah. Uh, what I've also noticed with you over, the, over time and also in preparation for this is, you've been like a master at adapting like comedy has changed rightfully or wrongfully over the years. You have to change kind of how you present yourself or your jokes. Mm. And then you also need to do other things just to kind of keep it going as well. And not a lot of people in any industry can thrive for like 20 plus years. I don't know how many years you've been doing it quite for. And uh, 27 or 28 now, well, yeah, 95 is when I first started the open. Yeah. 1995 open mic. There's Not literally, yes, yeah. yeah, so sorry for cutting off. There's literally only like a handful of people in Australia that have been doing it for as long as you and been able to do it for as long as you. And that comes with the ability to adapt. And that can be very scary. You've had success in one lane and you can stay in that lane. It's the same as that five minutes of jokes and not wanting mm. to do other stuff. That can be scary as well. And we could curse the world, oh, the world's going this way, but you've been able to adapt. You know, you talked about magic. Yes, you've been doing shows and I think I read somewhere that you might have a movie or talk show and doing a book, but you've been able to adapt with the times and it doesn't sound like you've been like upset and like cursing the world. You just know that you kind of have to do that, but it's a very important skill, especially in your space, the ability to adapt with the times. Is this something mm. that you're aware of or is it just? Yeah, well, look, the, maybe I'm not so aware of it, but like I don't stop. Like I'm, I'm always, uh, always working on stuff. Um, early on, Michael, like you know, I mean, most professional comedians will, will, you know, probably go through the same thing when you first start and you look at your diary, right? Because I left teaching, I left the business. Because uh, when I left teaching, I opened up a juice bar with my brother. Mm. That was just for something to fall back on. So when I wasn't doing comedy, I'd be in the shop, uh, but then I could take off wherever I wanted. Because the last year of teaching, I was, I was taking a lot of time off. Um, in the principle, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I can't. I can't yeah, right. Principle. I heard that the principal is quite sympathetic towards you. He's like, yeah, just go and do. But yeah, it was, a, it was a she, and and oh, sorry. Um, because I was doing a lot of extracurricular activity, I'd be I'd be part of the school musical, getting that ready. I'd be doing all these extra things, and um, you know, in turn, she said, okay. She turned. She goes, no, 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 you know, she knew I was doing comedy, and I'd be flying here and there and taking a lot of days off. Um, but eventually, I said, let, let me just. You know, do it on my own, open up a business. I took it in steps, uh, juice bar with my brother, 
then I could just take off whenever I wanted. And then eventually we sold the shop and then full-time comedy just sort of happened. And it was scary because yeah. you look at your diary and yes, this week and next week is pretty good. And this month's not bad. And there's like a little, maybe next month is might be one or two and then empty. And you go, all right, man, like this is like, it's scary. Like, you know, most people have a full-time job as come in, you've got to get booked. You've got to be moved. You've got to do you know, clubs and things. And, and, but eventually, of course, next month rolls around and gigs turn up in the month after. And you look back on the 12 months, you go, okay, well, that was pretty busy. Um, but it's still scary. But you learn to, you learn that, no, relax, it's going to be, you know, things will roll in. And But having said that, I don't stop. I just, I'm always working on stuff. Uh, so, you know, over the years, like, there'd be acting and, you know, we'd be doing shows and filming and, you know, I'll be working on um, my stand-up tours and then I'll be working on theatre shows. Uh, where we like you know where I write some big productions and and we we toured and it, and it wow. does well pitching stuff like that it's just non stop like, you know it's always work don't wait that's what I tell people don't wait be proactive you know um and yeah some people are funny because they come and say I mean you're an actor like I want to become an actor you know I I've, I've had that a few times like so if they say I want to become a stand up comedian I just say look just you got to get up there's no other way I can tell you all the theory you like. But you know, you've said enough. Stand up, write down some. You know who you are. Just get up and and get up and perform at open mic. There's another way. <laughs> or they say, I want to become an actor. I say, yeah, I want to. Really, I love it. I want to get into it. I, okay, really, okay. Well, I I always ask them back, what have you done about it? What do they say, Michael? Nothing. I go, what what do you expect? You think somebody's going to knock on your door and say, come and uh, feature in our movie? Okay, you're gonna gonna do something about it. Like, go join a theater group. Go get some lessons. Go join a acting classes. Like, you know, be be productive. Be proactive. Um, uh, and uh, so that's why I, I I'm I don't wait. I'm just proactive. Always. I like having different projects on the go. I like having different working on different things. Um, for example, uh, there was a huge sitcom in Australia called Here Come the Habibs, right now. That was an idea. That was that was my idea to come up with the concept, and I wrote two and a half pages, right, for this sort of TV show idea, and it sat on my laptop for ten years. Oh wow! I didn't know that. Yeah, like it's it's a fact, and it just sat on my laptop because I was doing other stuff. I was filming, doing other stuff, and uh, and but I'd, I'd I'd go back to it, and eventually, uh, you know, with my um, you know, one of my best mates, Rob Shahidi, who was in. Was in, in Fat Pizza, the full Lebanese guy, um, and uh, we we did a lot of stuff together over the years, like you know, collaborating a lot of stuff. And I said, listen, we should really do something about this show, because yeah, because I I I sent the show to him like years ago, and and he doesn't really like. I would say you don't know when there's a genius idea, Rob. Like, you know, he goes, oh yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Timing. It, Eventually, we said, let's do something about it. And then uh, the timing was right. Yes, you said it, Michael, timing. Timing and luck is everything in TV business. Um, and the timing was right because they wanted something left of center. And even if we pitched it five years earlier, I don't think they would have gone with a show called Here Come the Habibs. Because yeah. the TV, I realize there's a, lot of there's a lot of different streaming platforms. There's a lot of, what, a lot of different ways people are, uh, you know, absorbing their, their content these days. And, and uh, so their numbers are going down slow. They're still powerful, but um, they realize they've got to do something a little, little bit different. Yeah. And then they, it was an easy show for the executives, executives to understand. And that's key. Yeah. I was just about to say, I, I'm if pitching. Yeah. yeah. If you pitch a show and you're, gonna, you're the explaining and, and the executives are not, you know, they, they get a lot of things pitched. So when we say, Hey, we got an idea, a Lebanese family living in the suburbs, poor family, win lotto, and they move to a rich suburb and they stuff it up. They go, oh, we get that. Oh, we love it. We're all, oh, you know, they get it straight away and straight away they can see it. And within a, you know, one sentence like that, they, they got it. And, the pitch. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah. And I liked it straight away. And, and that was it. And, and people thought the show was about the Lebanese family, which it wasn't. It's was more about the white family next door and their prejudice. But people sort of miss that point, um, you know, like a family that move in and, and they completely change their behavior. <laughs> and, then, and it was really about them. 
even though you know as promoters you know here come the habibs um is really more about them and they were just as funny as the habib family well uh, yeah i i just think you know going back to like the fear side of like money you know you've left teaching and now you, you're looking at your calendar and there's a bit of fear there mm. of obviously because <laughs> you need money to live i'm also wondering on oh, when you create a show like that or you've done like the pizza franchise and you know that's steady income you're you're on Australian TV, so many people know you, and then that ends. Oh, well, here come the Habibs. That ends, and there's the steady income. Maybe you can't do stand-up as much, I'm, I'm not sure, but a lot of your times in that show are that it ends. And I know you've got like 10 things always on the go, but you would have a lot of focus on that, on those shows. Yeah. How have you been able to like cope when the shows end? Because that's also kind of scary when you put your heart and soul, you've written for Here Comes the Habib, This Is Your Baby, or oh, sorry, um, like pizza, the pizza franchise mm. as well. You, you're known. Is that scary? Do you remember the moments when it ended? You're like, oh god, what am I going to do now? Or just on to the next thing? No, I love it, Michael, because it was hard, hard bloody work. <laughs> 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 they give me back in the stand of a comedy, like you know. Um, no, yeah. like, it's they, they are long days on set. Admittedly, yeah. like you know, people, and and even uh, we did like fat pizza, how's those, you know, swift and shift careers. Um, People, and I often see these extras and guests come on, like especially the extras, and they get so excited. Oh my God, we love this show. And they're so pumped and they meet all the characters. And then three hours later, you see them just slumped on a corner. <laughs> like just slumped and they, they, they realize. And then, because you wait all day and people don't understand like if TV and movies and a lot of waiting and, and you've got to just be ready to go when, they, when you get called up, you know, and, and switched on. Uh, but you see a lot of waste, a lot of energy. Um, but yeah, they, they don't realize it's not all just camera lights, action. There's a lot of waiting. There's a lot of things. And just be ready when the camera's on. And don't play to the people around you. Like, because it's people, you know, th- th- a lot of people, I see that a lot, a lot of time on set. They're just trying to get the crew laughing or this, that laughing. And I always worry when that happens because it doesn't mean that people, audience or people watching will be laughing. Yeah, um, it's strange. You know, yeah, give, give the script some. Yeah, some credit and and uh but yeah it's it's a lot of long days but uh yeah just look move on to the next project move on to the next project that's my ethos it's still pretty hard like yeah you know. it's, i mean look i'm not doing stand-up during like some of those big filming days and uh, yeah. sometimes i am because it's you know usually it's monday to friday um week uh, but uh yeah it's 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 exciting because like you know you've finished something and you think, come on, let's let's move on. What's I always think like, what's next? You know, what can I move on to next? That's still very exciting. I like I like that attitude of like, what's next? Because you're still appreciating what you're doing, but then you're like, okay, that someone who really is immersed in life and loves life. But there's also something, and I just skimmed it a little while back, but I heard that there's maybe a movie coming out. Yeah, potentially you're in talks to host a TV show. I heard on another podcast you're writing a book. I don't know how you do these things and how you even balance your time. Is there anything you can talk about these and like the process of getting this all done? Yeah. Well, you know how uh, people was, some people say just work on one thing and concentrate on it. And just, I always work on what's taking my attention at the time. Yeah. Same as me. So, um, and I'm, as I said, like the best analogy is like the chef who's got like these, you know, all these things cooking at the same time, like, you know, get, you know, heat that up, heat this up. And, um, Yes, I want to write a book and I've started like the process. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, if I concentrate on that, like but other things take, like currently I'm doing um, a huge stage show called Once Upon a Time in Lebanon, and which has been a huge success, uh, well received. And that's taken like most of my time up uh, where I was, um, I'm the director, head writer, and I have a small part in it. I'm doing with Rob Shady and Anthony Salaman, my mates. Oh, cool. and, um, and it's been really positive and, yeah, the numbers have been incredible, but that's taken my time. For example, and I've got um, and I've got uh, some movie ideas as well, of course, and and I've, I've spent a lot of time on those ideas over the years. Like you know, you 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 you're a scriptwriter, right? You love scriptwriting, and and ideally, Mike, I would love to be locked up for four weeks, nothing but but you know, you can't because there's life it gets in the way. There's other things happen. There's uh, you know, uh, there's family and there's other gigs and tours and work to do. And uh, so I work on it when I can. And 
so I would love to do, I've got a great um, idea for a children's movie as well, like, which is uh, something like, uh, yeah, I like to do different stuff. But yeah, I like to do a drama, like a children's movie. And oh, then cool. I want to do it like, hats. yeah, different, like, yeah, different stuff. Like, you know, and I've, I'm always working on some TV shows where we we'll, we'll really work on the characters, the pilot, and we're ready to pitch. Um, we we did a pilot called uh, "This Is Not a Tonight Show," and so it's a fake Tonight Show, which is uh, it's a different spin on. It's sort of elements have been done like that before, but we put a different spin on it. We just film the pilot, and I'll shop that around. Um, oh, people nice. say yes, people say no. Like it doesn't really matter because we just we just move on. You know? Like it's it's just um, the, I think. What I've seen, uh, some people have an idea for a show and it becomes their passion project. Mm. But it's a trap also because I say, okay, you cannot just have, and they're working on it for years and that's their thing. I said, you can't fall in love. I, mean, I, I, I do, but I just keep, you know, I love like this, not a tonight show. I know that the show will be great and will work, but as much as I love it, I've got to work on other stuff. And if someone else doesn't see the, you know the love like I see it, uh, but it becomes a try. I go, mate, you got to work on different stuff. Like, you know, um, often when we pitch things, so here's our idea, but we have something in our back pocket. To, oh, to like flick, what's flick it. next? They always yeah, we, ask we'll, what's next. We'll do it on the way out, Michael. Hey, by the way, have a look at this. <laughs> like, and these they go, hey, we love that. We love that. Just, um, I guess not putting all your eggs in one basket is is probably what I'm saying. But yeah, great. Uh, but yeah, I just. We'd love to do. I'm always working on stuff, and I love doing that. And I know I love ha you know having that, and I love to write my book. It'll be entertaining. There, we've got so many stories, uh, some serious bits. The the you know even migrating from Turkey, um, coming out here, and um, some of those stories which I haven't mentioned on stage, and you know um, it it'll be, and I'm not sure if it if that's a book on its own or um, or is this the comedy stories alone would be the whole book. Or it's TV. common experiences, could like, even, you know? Could even be podcast, TV series. There's a lot you can do with that. Just this this is not, this is something I want to share with you, which I like, this is not the title of the book, but, uh, you know, I want to call, you know, I was, I was thinking about calling, but it won't be the unluckiest lucky guy. I uh, like that. Or yeah. the luckiest unlucky guy. And that's why I say, my people go, man, you've done a lot of work, but I say, yeah, I, I get lucky in a lot of situations, but then I get unlucky as well. Um, you know, like so, comedy for me, the way I see it is like, and I explained like, and this is going into your failure sort of theme, you know. Um, comedy starts, I'm going great, but I can't get on the Melbourne Comedy Gala. I see that as unlucky, right? I I get here, come the Habibs up, then I get another TV show up called Street Smart, right, which is on Channel Ten. My own sitcom, finally, yes, I do it, and the executives don't like it, and we we don't get it. We don't get it pushed. And within one episode, even though the numbers were not bad, we get shafted to like a late night slot. Man, I'm lucky. I finally get my seat. Then unlucky. And I remember like, yeah, I go, man, you've got to give this a go. And even so they sort of admitted, oh, we didn't really promote it. Why? But, and, you know, I get on, I get on, um, I get on, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Right? Oh, yeah. Season five. Lucky, yes, I love this show. I want to do it. I, you know, I because I, I do things for an experience, absolutely love my experience, right? But then I'm unlucky because I don't get to do that many challenges. Why? Because some guy has now broken the record on my episode as the most challenges. Like, so people could just, you know, he kept getting the challenges, and I'm going, man, why my episode? Why my season? I want to do the challenges. Like, they had no idea. I was scared of, like, I was generally scared of heights and. All that sort of rubbish, and they would have got a re great rea you know, reaction out of me. So I ended up having to, again, Michael, come up with my own entertainment on the show. So I'm doing my own stuff to entertain the, 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 the people, and a lot of stuff I did didn't make it to the air. I got told after, but so I was coming up with my own content, and um, they were enjoying it. Um, but I said, it's unlucky. Like, and, they, and they were choosing random people on the show to do things, not even audience voted. But it wasn't me. I'm gonna again. I don't like it. Why do I, I want to experience that? You know, like so. Uh, that's why I say people think, man, you're lucky to be on the show. Then I, I see it differently. Like you know, the the luckiest unlucky guy, or the how would you like to see it? You know, um, it. it's a it's a funny way to look at, it, isn't it? Like you know, very interesting. It's I... it's it's, 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 it's yeah, it's perspective, isn't it? Like whichever way you look at it. But 
there's things like that. I'd probably write a book and, you know, so, or, you know, like I get a break and then I feel in my head something unlucky happens. You know what I mean? There's a lot of comedy there. I think yeah, there is. One of, well, kind of like back to what you're saying is like perspective is everything and how you see the world. But even just, I can just, the comedy lens of, you know, you get something and then it doesn't quite go the, the way you want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot there. But just something, even though you said before then, like this industry can be quite volatile and you've got a show that gets made it and they kind of can it or whatever. You're like, oh shit, what am I going to do? But because you've got so many different eggs in the basket, I butchered that saying, it makes people less attached. And I, when I, I'll give you an example on my end. When I first wrote my show, which hasn't been made, I spent two years on that. I was like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever done. Because one, if it doesn't go quite to plan or they want to change it or it's not sellable, then I've got nothing. So then I think I wrote six shows in one go. And now, only finally now, I've got some interest. I'm in contract negotiation. But it's because I was writing and doing other things. And it took away from the pressure. And as you said, let, less attached yeah. to it, an outcome. So you can... Is yours a m- movie or TV show? See, I've written a movie, but... Nothing's been made yet, but yeah, TV. This I, is a TV series. I tell people it's actually easier to get a movie up these days than a than a TV show. It's, it's a lot of yeah. a lot of luck, you know. There's a lot of people pitching, uh, timing. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things involved. Whereas a movie, you can you can, it's, you know, it's almost, if it's good, yeah, these yeah, days, yeah. like you can sort of you know, equipment's a lot cheaper. Most people can get it. You know, ask for some favors, and you know, we can do a movie quite easily. You know, there'd be, um, of course, you you got to get people to show it, <laughs> and it's going to be good. Yeah, that's and, the challenge. And it's funny, like even if we talk about that, like you know, um, I mean, you know, success or failure, which is the theme of your podcast, right? But mm. you know, when you see a movie, isn't it funny? I was thinking this is the way my head works. I go, is when you do, and I've been involved in a, a number of movies and and TV sitcoms. Um, when you're filming something, no one thinks it's bad at the time. You know what I mean? Like everyone thinks, oh yeah, like. So it, it makes me think as human beings, sometimes we're not honest, we lie. Like, you know, we, we, we almost trick ourselves. You know, sometimes I see a movie come out and I'm thinking, how do they make that? We all think that is absolute shit, rubbish. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely. So, so, and, and, we, and it's universally agreed, like that was a rubbish movie, panned and, you know, nothing redeeming about it. But of course, someone wrote that movie. And then not only did they write it, they pitched it and someone else read it and said, yeah, you know what? This is really good. And then someone said, hey, that's so good. I'm going to throw some money into it. And they got some money and then they a money. had a lot of money and then they filmed it. And during the filming, they all said, yeah, man, yeah, this is going really good. And the, and the acting is good and the script is good. And you, you know, so every process, every step of the way, it wasn't picked up that, hey, you know what? This is actually not that good. Yeah, this is actually- no, no one came and- in. Nobody came in. Nobody sets out to do that. Don't get me wrong. Nobody says, "Hey, let's go and do a shit movie." But <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, maybe like Sharknado, they do. But <laughs> well, yeah, unless you're doing the room or something, like you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, at some point, like yeah, you've got to be. Uh, yeah, it's like comedy. Like these, you know, when you first start, you can, you know, you go, oh, "This can be funny." It's, it's not that funny. But nowadays, I can sort of like ninety percent success rate. Like you know, I can, yeah, this can be funny, and generally, I can make it funny. Um, and it's like yeah, movies. So, of course, what I love about that process is I love people who have put their balls on the line. So, I have respect for anyone who's made a movie mm. because you've actually gone the trouble of writing a script and getting it done. Hats off, no matter how it goes. A lot of people could talk about movies and talk about, oh, I've got a great script idea. You done anything about it? No. Well, you've got to write it. Have you, you got it up? Like, yeah. So, anybody who's got a movie up, hats off because i know the process is is you know um it, it, the process involved and you've actually done something about it which is to me i admire thank you i appreciate it and that's a, a lot of the advice that i've been getting for, as well it's put pen to paper everyone's got the million dollar idea but are you, can you actually execute it actually yeah. on that going on a completely different tangent i don't know if this haunts you i want to hear your perspective I think I heard you on another podcast talk about you came up with the idea of like chocolate with the um, toys inside. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Do you do you think about that? Because if you would have made that, you would be. I know. I was like it was so weird, like because uh, that's funny. So you heard that, did you? Yeah. Mm. Like so, yeah. I um, 
because I love business as well. Like I love business. I love yeah. ideas and 19 you know, cafes or you used to, or something like that. Yeah. I'm involved in a franchise called the shed cafe. I'm a yeah. silent partner. My brother and my mates do all the work yeah. and I don't actually do anything really, to be honest. That, I'm, that's I'm, the, a win. I'm the marketing guy. So yeah, awesome. in other words, I just, I, I just rock up to op store openings. Um, but uh, yeah, I, just, I thought I invest you know, a bit of my money into that and, and uh, it's fun. I've always, you know, my family's always done business over the years and stuff with the juice bars and different stuff. And we've had, uh, but I had this idea of a pet egg, right? So pet egg. Yep. And that was a, like, you know, and I thought uh, like an egg and then it opens up and it's a small pet that comes into it. And it's your pet. And, and, and I wondered, you know, this is, we're talking back, well, we're talking 20 years ago. Yeah. Before uh, kinder and before all that sort of stuff. And, and I, I want to get a couple of samples made and I couldn't even get the sample made. Like I, I tried to get to someone and they said, oh yeah, like I said, can I get an egg, sort of plastic egg made? And I remember going around to some places and, and just couldn't get it done. And I wanted to get, I'd get some drawings done, some the pets. And, and it was long, I saw the uh, Cabbage Patch dolls. I don't know if people remember that, but it was like yes. Cabbage Patch and you had to, the whole idea, you had to rock up and swear that this is your baby and there's a certificate. And, and it was long, so those sort of lines, it's the egg and it, it hatches and, and it's your pet and then it's yours and you can name it and all that sort of stuff. And, and you know what? I could never, I just didn't have the contacts, Michael. And I had the idea and um, I just needed someone to back me at the time. And uh, I wish somebody would do that. I'd say, Hey, you got some ideas. I want to back you. I would love for, you know, I would love for someone to come up and said that, but yeah, pet eggs. And then of course I saw years later, like kind of surprise and um, which is a chocolate and a toy coming out and still going, I don't know. I don't know when that was developed, to be honest. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would, I would love to see that come to fruition. Did that um, change how you go about anything? Like, do you ever think about that or like, oh, and it's pushed you in a certain direction? It's all like, oh, just missed opportunity. Uh, no, it's, I just laugh about it. Cause I, like, I don't know how my idea would have gone. Like, you know what I mean? Well, I don't I know. We, was... uh, who knows? It would have been massive. Who, it could still, I don't know if someone has even uh, done that now. Like, uh, you know, is there a pet egg? I've got no idea. I don't, I'm not aware of it, but just yeah, even the idea of having something come out of the chocolate or whatever it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mine yeah. was not chocolate; it was just plastic, and then yeah, you, yeah. You give it a name, and um, well, we should do it. Like we should just look. You and I should do it, Michael. You, you <laughs> back it, and I'll, I'll pull some strings. <laughs> Let's do yeah. it. So, uh, but yeah, look, it doesn't. I just laugh, you know. Like it was, it just move I'm on good. to the. You know what? Move on to the next idea. Yeah, that's what you. That's that's yeah. when I talk about pivoting and being able to move forward and wearing different hats. That's from what I've seen makes someone. Well, that seems to be one of the key traits in this industry is just being able to move on to the next one, appreciate what's happened, you know, absorb it, don't sweep it under the rug, but on to the next one. Yeah. With, I, I love the whole creativity too. Like I love directing, I love writing, I love editing. I find editing beautiful. Like, I, I'm I, jealous I, of you. I love editing. Like it's, I, it's so creative because that's what can make a break editing as well, you know. And yep. these days everyone can edit because they've got the phones and the programs. It's it's so much easier these days. Honestly, like I think the, you know, people these, these days, like they have no idea what it was like, you know, um, you can write a book. Uh, there's a, there's an app. You just speak and it just writes the words. You don't have to type up these days. Wow. I'm going to look into that. That's yeah. yeah. You just, you just talk and most phones even have that feature, believe it or not. But yeah. You can look into it. So you just talk and it just types up the words and then somebody goes back and fix it all up, you know? Um, yeah, it's a lot, a lot easier these days. Well, I'm still very impressed. What we're going to do now to wrap up the podcast is to do a rapid fire segment. So the first thing that springs yep. to mind, but if you need time to think about it, sure, let me know. Um, I have like 500 points I also want to tie up. So we'll see how we do this. Is it true that on um, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, you snuck food? Yes, it's true. <laughs> did you get caught? <laughs> uh, I did get caught. And I was the only one, right? I, I, so I, I got this, I remember I was in a hotel before, like we got admitted into the jungle and I wrapped this banana up in, in aluminium foil. And uh, then I got these muesli bars. Um, so the bananas wrapped in aluminium foil, muesli bars and other stuff, biscuits from the hotel, <laughs> the cookies. The yeah, they were wrapped up, right? And, I, and I, I worked out, there was no cameras in the toilet. Very smart. So I was in the toilet, there was rocks everywhere. So I, I, I hid all the food 
<laughs> wrapped, mind you, wrapped. Right? Uh, They're all wrapped like in, in amongst all the rocks. And of course, uh, they said, listen, we know you got food. You know, come out with it now or everyone gets punished. The first time I didn't, I didn't budge. I said, no, I don't think they know. And the second time they said, listen, we know exactly where the food is. Everyone's going to get punished. And I thought, oh my God, they're on to me. And they weren't. I could have got away with it. Oh, they just were hoping that you would. Yeah, I, I gave it up from the toilet. Everyone laughed their heads off, of course. They said, no, he was hiding stuff in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Protein bars and music. So yeah, I, I did. It was, it was funny. Oh, uh, wow. And I took a violin in there, which I couldn't play. <laughs> People thought like, he's just joking. Because like they said, can you bring in, you're allowed to bring in a luxury item. Oh, actually. Yeah, that was, everybody was allowed one luxury item. So um, some people brought like, you know, actually a luxury item for themselves. I, I interpreted that as like a violin is luxurious, luxury item. So I brought in a violin. You can play and the violin? No, I can't. I, cu I couldn't play it at all. So why did you bring the no, violin? No, because I thought it was a luxury item. Right? Out of all <laughs> the things, the violin. So people, people laughed and then they thought, no, you can. And then I said, no, I, and I, I, I tried to play it. It was just so horrible. And they were, and they were laughing. They go, okay, when are you, when are you gonna, gonna go into your, and I said, listen. And then they finally worked out, he genuinely can't play this violin. <laughs> it's so obscure. It's so like, and then I, I played it while they're sleeping and, and they get me, they get the shits and they want to put in the fire and burn it. And um, yeah, the violin was my item. It was just it was really weird, but yeah. Well, that, that is the strangest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> the weirdest thing ever taken to the jungle. A violin. Yeah, at least it'll be there for history. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've alluded to this. What's been your special ingredient to work all these years? Uh, have different projects on the go and um, don't be put off uh, with a no, because in this industry, that's what happens is there's, there's peer, peer pitching all the time. You know, you've got to believe in what you, what, what you have and, and, and you, you have to, because um, yeah. And, 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 but don't, have different things on the go. Have different things on the go. Don't just, like, you know, I've got like, you know, three different movie ideas of which I'm working on, you know, I mean, which I love. Um, you know, I love the children's genre because, you know, I've, I'm, you know, because I know the genre works as well. Mm. But, you know, I mean, and I wouldn't, I, I, I don't do an, animation because I don't have $200 million to comp compete with Pixar. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm so, going to do that one as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, work on, find a you know gap in the market and try to fill it. You're a businessman as well, which is rare. A lot of creatives don't have that <laughs> as well. Um, do you have a philosophy on life that you follow or anything that springs to mind? Well, yeah, I gave you that quite early on and, and, and I try to like live by it. Like, so, so I'm pretty level-headed and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't get upset that easily, which is... Um, uh, which I found like, you know, uh, early on in my life, like if something happens, I just move on as quick as I can and uh, where possible. Um, but uh, yeah, remember the quote, to make yourself happy or miserable takes a certain amount of effort. That could be the theme of the podcast. I love that. I'm going to be thinking yeah. about that as well. Um, quote, everybody should up on that wall, have it up on the wall. You realize, oh yeah, I get that. I get that. Huh? I actually can see it right there. I, I think yeah, I yeah. that actually. Um, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? Uh, it's a good question, Michael. And, and, but it's a question which um, I, I'm not scared of. Right? So I'm not scared of failure. I, I've had failure. I'm not scared of it. I don't, I, I don't worry about it. I just say, right, that didn't work. I move on. What's, what's next? Or, you know, that show didn't quite hit the mark. Let's move on. So I, I'd, I'd be, if, if there was no failure. I'd still be doing the same. I'd just be pitching stuff and, and, and creating my own. Like, you know, like, so I guess the question is, if I had half a billion dollars, you know, what would I, I'd, I'd make movies. Whether they go good or bad, I'd just make them. Yeah. And I'd help, I'd help others achieve their, like, say, right, what can I help you with? Like, you know, right, what do you want to do? Let's just do it. Uh, let's make this show. Like, it could be good or bad. Always put the balls on the line, you know, um, and yeah, put it on the line. And I had no problem doing that. That is a brilliant answer. I won't comment on them because I'll derail them, but that's, <laughs> that's awesome. 
Um, so I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have any regrets. Uh, I think everyone has regrets, but you know, like because you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, of course. Yep. So yeah, like you know, we all look back and oh, maybe I would have um, pitched that differently. Like you know, even looking at Street Smart, that that show, like you know, uh, the sitcom, which was really well received by the people, who, because it was a fam- it was a show for families more than anyone, and the families loved it. They said, oh, you know how much we enjoyed that show, watching with our grandparents and kids. There's not a lot of shows that you know all three generations can watch. It was slapstick humor, and uh, but I saw it was going a different direction during the writing process. And was, I remember one month out from filming, I said, listen, this is not going exactly the direction I wanted it. Um, it was too late. I, I couldn't change it. I could see where it was heading. Mm-hmm. I, just, I just couldn't change it. We're just too far into it. And, um, you know, look, looking back on things, is always like, you know, like here come the hub is huge, big budgets, big funding, and, and we wanted more comedy in it. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we couldn't quite, you know, they were more into the storylines. And well, I get that. I get all that. But, you know, comedy. That's, we wanted more laughs, more laughs. It was very funny. It was, again, well-received, great numbers. Um, but, yeah, I think, we, yeah, we, looking back, you always have regrets. You, you can always look back and change things. But my philosophy is don't harp on that. You know, you know the old saying, you can't change the past. Yep. You, know, you can't. I would, I would say, right, that didn't work out. Yeah, I regret that. But what are we doing next? You, you know, like look forward, look forward. Don't look back. Look forward. And it sounds yeah, like it is. But regrets, yeah, but regrets. Of course, yeah, yeah. of course, we, everyone's got regrets. You have to have as a human being. It it sounds like it informs you in a positive way that you learn from them and that it helps you for the next project as well. Yeah, yeah you got to learn from it. Awesome. If you could go back into a time when you were first starting out. Would you give you what advice would you give yourself if you would? Oh, that's an easy one, Michael. I would say, don't do uni, right? Get straight into comedy. I, yep. I would, I would actually leave. I should have left school in year ten. But don't worry about the, you know, y- y- the, the senior years. Um, heck, year nine. Why not just leave in year nine yep. and get straight into the open mics and get straight into comedy? Uh, but of course, it's not that easy because you've got to be uh, mentally ready as well and. And, uh, you, you know, you, you've got to be in the right mindset. And um, But uh, that would have been awesome if I just got straight into it. And, you know, um, yeah, I would have loved it. would have loved it straight. Yeah. Awesome. Um, before I ask how people can follow you, and I know that you're touring, and we'll talk about that in a sec, what is the one question I should have asked you? Maybe there's something you want to tie up or anything that springs to mind. Uh, you know what? You've done your research pretty good, Michael. I'm pretty impressed. I'm <laughs> Thank very, you. Very, I'm very, very impressed. And uh, I think you've covered, yeah, I, I, I can't think of any sort of question. Um, what's my favorite food? No, no. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I think you've, you've, you've covered, yeah, you've, you've gone to some nice areas. I like it. Awesome. It's nice to talk about, you know, because these are two about people's, uh, you know, successes, but uh, it's also nice to talk about failures and, and how you react to that as well. And I think it's important. It's important, you can, um, especially in this day and age, you know? Yeah, I agree. We just kind of focus on, we just see the end result. We don't see the process and the journey yeah, of yeah. the person as well. Um, before we go, I know you've got some shows coming up. Um, can you tell me a little bit about them and how people can? Yeah. Um, like there's, there's always shows like it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I've, I've got, I'm, I'm part of a, like a multicultural comedy gala touring the country. I'm going to be touring uh, later this year with a show called the proper way to immigrate, the proper way to immigrate, you know, um, that's very catchy headline. Well, I, and I'll talk about how I came from, you know, it, it's almost like a, looking back on my journey going, like going through, um, we, we we sort of touched on the children's magic show. Maybe uh, yeah, that's a question you like. Oh uh, yeah, please tell me about that and how yeah, you so discovered magic. That's a question. So I love magic and I love comedy. I've always loved comedy magic over the years. And in another lifetime, I would have been a comedy magician, right? Oh wow! But I love my stand so much that I, I can't give it up to be like. Yeah. But um, so over the years, my I've collected a lot of stuff. I collected magic tricks. I bought magic tricks. And I didn't always, 
And and finally, my, my, my missus said, listen, what are you doing with all these tricks? Like, you should just do a show. Oh, like, God. honestly, honestly, I, I would have had over 10 grand worth of magic tricks. <laughs> honestly, like, yeah, awesome. so much. And then I worked out while I was at these festivals, I was at the Adelaide Fringe, which I love. I always go to the Adelaide Fringe, you know, one of the best festivals in the world. And um, I'd be there for five weeks doing my adult shows and the adult shows are going, well, what am I doing during the day? Nothing. So I said, why don't I do a show? And I call myself the world's best, worst magician. <laughs> so that was my, that was my title. Uh, that's great. So if, if, if a trick w didn't work, which very likely to, because, you know, um, I'd say, well, <laughs> you saw the title. I'm the world's best, worst magician. Oh, right? that's so good. Yeah. So, and guess what? The show started going really well. Like I was filling up and, and I worked out, hey, people are coming to see me adults with kids who can't come to my adult show, but they're fans. So they, they turn up with their, you know, with, with their TV tops. Of, I go, oh my God, they're, but they bring their kids along. And so, and my shows were, because I've seen a lot of sort of magic shows over the years, and my shows were just as entertaining for the adults as well as the kids. Kids would get like, you know, so I'd see a lot of the entertainers, they just concentrate kids only. While the kids are my focus, I always throw a couple of bones to the adults and they're enjoying the show just as much, my magic words are not like, you know, abracadabra, it's, oh my God, <laughs> you know, and it's, oh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun and, and I, pre I present it in a sort of different way with my sort of uh, take on a lot of the tricks. Um, and it just worked. It worked the treat. And this is funny because I haven't said this before. At, at one of the comedy galas in Sydney, I did a bit, little bit of shit magic, right? And the adults <laughs> love shit magic, like just doing uh. really shit tricks. Oh, yeah. that's so funny. And someone in the audience saw it, an executive, and they said, that should be a TV show, believe it or not. Like, and, and now they want to like, you know, say, okay, we'll do a, you know, this, this magician who's really shit, um, and, but he does his tricks. But the thing is, he's got real powers, right? <laughs> so, but he can't use it because it'd be too obvious. And anyway, that's, you know, it could come about, it could not, you know, it's going to be pitched, see what happens. Um, wow so it's working on it but and then and then get this australia's got talent show that people know all around the world like you know america's got talent because they saw it and they said we want you on our show really they went yeah. to you and i said what i'm not going to do come and do comedy they go no no not stand up we want to do you we want to see your shit magic on the show we'd love it and i thought about it, i thought you know because me i take risks i never worry about because people think People ask me, they go, did you worry about your image when you went on the show? I go, no, not at all. I, I don't care about any of that sort of stuff. Cool. People see me as a kid, but no, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Would you worry about, no, I do it for an experience. I love it. Like it's an experience I can do in my life that not everybody has a chance to do. Even if you're a billionaire, you don't get to experience that. You know, like it, it doesn't really. So I do things for fun. I do things what I want to do. I said, I'll do it. I just don't mention my name, Tahir. So they go, no worries. So I went on as the world's best, worst magician. <laughs> and it, it went really, really well. Um, and, uh, you know, I went on and Shay Jacobson, one of the judges said, hey, Tahir. They go, no, no, no. I'm the world's best, worst magician. <laughs> <laughs> you, you look like Tahir. I go, no, 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 no. I'm the world's best, worst. And, uh, yeah, the kids loved it. Like, you know, when I came out, it was just it was incredible once the footage that came is out such a good idea it's amazing how with the word shit in it or that you can make something so funny oh, yeah so i now so if i i'm you know i'm going to go to brisbane for the for the comedy festival and i'll do my adult show at night time but guess what during the day i'm doing the world's best worst magician and the and the kids turn up and and you know i can make better use of my time and i enjoy it it's a heck of a lot of work, Michael. You have no yeah, idea. I would imagine. Oh my God. <laughs> the setup. Then it takes me a long time to set up. And then I've got to do the show. I'm going to pack it all up. And then I realize how much more I love stand up comedy. We just rock up, you know, and to do the show. Yeah, and, and go out. And, and you're gone. But, but I still love it. Like, I love doing it. I'm not scared of the tricks failing, you know, which they can, you know. It ties so, into what you're doing. Yeah. So a lot of magicians, they're very good magicians, but their comedy is a little bit old school. Whereas I'm coming from the other way. I've got the comedy and I can make an audience laugh. And now I'm more worried about the tricks. They're, they're, they're very good magicians. They're worried about the comedy. I'm 
you know, really worry about the tricks, but I've realized I'm very relaxed with it. And, you know, and I'll do a shit trick, shit trick. All of a sudden I'll do a trick and the audience will go, oh my God, he just did something. <laughs> and, and that's that, great. Yeah. And that blows them away. They go, oh, man, hang on. How did he just, he just did a, you know, he just made that change in the, you know, and, and that blows them away. You know? And then we go back to, that's the formula. I got shit trick, shit trick, then a good trick, you know, and I explain magic as well. I explain how to do it with a fake way, not a proper way. So I'm going, this is how you do this trick and, and that becomes funny. And um, yeah, it's, it's working good and I'm enjoying it. You've got a customer in me. I know you've got a website. <laughs> does your website also have, does it have stand up and the magician stuff as well? It does. I think that's probably the best way. Tahir.com.au. Uh, T-A-H-I-R. Um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Tahir Comedian where all the shows. So rather than people, you know, this could come out at any time. Um, so people get to go to Tahir Comedian on Instagram and Facebook and that's got usually my shows or, or my website. Yeah. I'll upload all of them in the episode notes so people can check them out. But yeah. you've got, you've got, I'm going to go and see that as well. That you got to uh, come to the, I say adults love the magic show just as much. I, I got to tell you this story. Like last year, Sydney comedy festival, I was doing my adult show and I was doing my magic show, right? The magic shows during the day, like it's usually like 2 PM or 3 PM, something like that. Kid friendly time, not, Adult shows at night time, obviously. It happened two different couples, right? They buying tickets to my show. They thought they'll buy tickets to my adult show, which in fact they'll buy tickets to my children's magic show, which is really weird. Very Not different. thinking, why is he performing at 2 p.m. in the afternoon? They, they probably, or well, that's when he does his shows. Yeah. They've rocked up and they're going, and they've turned up, right? <laughs> and I, remember, I only found out because they met me after the show and they said, and I gave them. Tickets, free tickets to my adult show. But they said, um, oh, so nobody, else, nobody else do that, please. I, the gig's up. If you, if you, <laughs> yeah. so, well, it's their responsibility now. They turned up, Michael, and they're going, geez, there's a lot of kids at his show. Well, you're not even cotton on what's going on. You know? <laughs> they go, there's a lot of kids at his show. This is a bit weird. I go, what do you think it's weird to all these kids to turn up to your adult show? Like, And then I go, why is the stage full of props and that? This is going to be weird. And of course, once the show starts, I realize that this is a children's magic show. And they said, I'm not just making it up, they've never laughed so much. That's <laughs> the whole scenario. And then they came to our adult show as well. But it happened two occasions. People missing the different shows I'm doing, which is can happen, of course, if I'm doing the shows, but it's probably you know pretty clear. But but it was good to hear Had a that. Good time. that yeah, yeah. yeah, it was good to hear that. It was really good to hear that. Oh, uh, you you de- I'm not just saying as you sold this, I'm gonna come and watch these shows when I can and yeah, I think that's amazing. I, lo- I love your ability to be able to like try different things and you've got this like beautiful energy about you where you're like onto the next thing, but in a positive way and you've got a very inspiring story. So thank I you, really Mike. appreciate it. And yeah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And Thank you, Michael. I'm going to say pleasure chatting to you. Um, you give a lot of leeway. Uh, you do your research. Well done, man. Like I'm really, I love it when people have done the research. Really good. Uh, thank you. Yeah. You know, you go into areas that uh, you haven't been asked before, which is really, which would be nice. I love to hear his quote that he applies in his daily life. You can make yourself miserable or happy. It takes the same amount of work. This really speaks volumes to me as oftentimes we as humans can lean towards the negative. What to hear is proposing here is to view the world through a different lens, a more positive light. That doesn't mean we ignore the negative aspects and pretend they aren't there. It simply means that we don't allow negativity to manifest and consume us. Tahir gently encourages us and empowers us to realize that feeling good or bad is simply a choice. He is one of the most mesmerizing people I've ever met. It's easy to fall in love with his character as he simply embodies joy and happiness. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy.